So there's a lot of interest right now in biofuels in harnessing cellulase, just like you're talking about, not so much for food purposes, but more for making things with them, with grass that's otherwise just thrown away. Yes, Lynette. So the bacteria produce, the, her question is, bacteria just produce it and excrete it in the room? And the, the answer is basically yes, that's what they do. Yeah. Yes, sir? The bacteria are contained in their rumen. So, yeah, so where do they get it to start with? I believe they get it from their mother, actually. I think they get it from their mother. So it can be passed from one, one to the next, but I, I, I don't quote me on that. I, I'm not an animal scientist, but I believe I, I recall that from my... Um, olden days in animal science, actually. Okay. Now, as I said, cellulose provides structural integrity to the cell walls of plants. That's why they make it. It gives them solidness. Plant cell walls are pretty rigid. And one of the reasons they're rigid is because they've got this very nice backbone that's built into them that's cellulose, and it's pretty stable to a lot of different uh, treatments. Gesundheit. Okay, what am I looking at here? Okay, don't, don't mess with this. this. This is depicting actually amylose. It says starch, but it's not just starch, okay? Starch is, is comprised of two things. Amylose, as I showed you before, and a related compound called amylopectin. Now, we see a new bond here. In amylose, we saw alpha-1,4 linkages. In amylopectin, we see alpha-1,4 linkages, but whoa, what's happening right here? What's happening right here is I've got an alpha-1,6 linkage. Amylopectin differs from amylose in containing what we call branches that have a one, an alpha-1,6 bond. Now, this branch will go for a ways. In amylopectin, we see branches approximately every 30 to 50 residues. I may go 30 to 50 of these and all of a sudden branch. And then I split it off like that. Now, what branching allows is it allows for compaction. You can actually pack more sugar residues in the same place if you do that. We contain in our bodies a related compound called glycogen. Glycogen is like amylopectin in that it's comprised only of glucose. These guys are all comprised only of glucose. Glycogen also has alpha-1,4 linkages, and glycogen also has alpha-1,6 branches. What's different? We have branches a lot more frequently than plants do. Glycogen is much more branched. About every 10 residues, we see a branch in glycogen. Amylopectin is relatively simple in structure. Glycogen is very complex in structure because of all these branches and branches of branches and branches of branches. We can imagine that we've got an awful lot of ends of this thing. So if we think this is the end of the, of the molecule, here's an end of the molecule, the more branches we have, the more ends that we have, right? The more free glu or the more glucose we have hanging off the end, not attached to something else. That turns out to be very important. It's very important for us as animals. And the reason that our glycogen is branched is because we are animals. What does that mean? Animals can run. Animals run to catch prey. Animals run to escape prey. Animals, therefore, need quick sources of energy. Plants are sedentary. Plants don't get a chance to run. If a cow decides it's going to come and eat you, you sit there and wait for it to eat you. Why is that important? Well, we use glycogen to store glucose. We use glucose to contract muscles. The more ends that we have, the more glucoses we can break off at once because the enzymes that break down glycogen start at the ends and chew inwards. More ends means more glucose can be freed very quickly. Plants, because they can't move, don't have that. They use this and they can take their sweet time in how fast 
they clip this thing off when they need energy. Make sense? So our energy needs vary tremendously. And that's reflected in our glycogen. We'll say more about glycogen as we, as we get going further along. OK, so if we look at glycogen, schematically, it looks a little bit like that. This, and this is probably even a little simplified. This shows about every, I don't know, 10, 15 residues. This shows about every five residues. In reality, this is more like about every 10. This is more like about every 50. But, the, but you get the idea. This guy is, in fact, much more branched than is amylopectin. One last thing I want to point out, I forgot to point out in the last slide, and that's this. Uh, right here. OK. You see that alpha 1,6 branch? You'll notice it branches, but then the next one is 1,4, 1,4, 1,4. All that the 1,6 does is it provides that branch point, but then we just stay 1,4. So if I were to ask you on an exam, how many alpha 1,6s would you expect to see in an amylopectin, you'd probably say, I'd expect to see about one every 30 to 50 glucoses, right? I wouldn't expect to see a whole bunch of them because the branch does not go 1,6. Only that one place where it makes the branch does that. OK. Your question? What determines when it branches? We'll talk about that later in the term, but I'll answer your question because you've asked. So what determines where it branches? You have an enzyme in your body that has a very curious name. It's called branching enzyme. <laughs> it's true. And so it's called branching enzyme. And branching enzyme is set up so that it, it sits down on a glycogen and measures out about 10 uh, sugars and then makes a branch. So it's, 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 it's a cool, uh, cool enzyme. Yes, sir? Are the enzymes that break down amylopectin and glycogen the same? That's a very good question. You know, in, in plants, I honestly don't know. Um, certainly in uh, breaking down glycogen, we'll talk a lot about the enzymes that animals use. I would doubt if plants use exactly the same setup because ours, as you will see, are set up to release glucose very quickly, and the plants don't have that need. So I don't think plants would have the same setup as we do. But you know, I've never been asked that question. It's a very good question, Mitch. I don't know. OK, good questions. Uh, blah, blah. Amino sugars. What's an amino sugar? Obviously, it has an amine in it. There are several variants of these amino sugars. OK? Here's, a, here's one called N-acetylglucosamine. You can see there's glucose. It's glucose uh, in the beta configuration. There's the hydroxyl up. Okay. Instead of an OH, we have an NH. And that NH is attached to an acetyl group. That's what that is there. That's why it's called N-acetyl beta-D-glucosamine. Okay. So this is another chemically modified sugar. And it's not a trivial one. We'll see this one appears in various things like glycoproteins. Another place where we see this is this guy is the monomeric unit. When I say monomeric unit, what does that mean? Something you use to build something bigger. So if I have a polymer of this, then the monomeric unit is the one thing that repeats over and over and over. Okay? This is a monomeric unit of chitin. Chitin is the uh, exoskeleton of insects. It's a polymer of N-acetylglucosamine. Chitin is spelled C-H-I-T-I-N. Chitin is a polymer of N-acetylglucosamine, and it ex forms the exoskeleton of insects. It's different from what's in your nails, yes. Yes, You're, you don't have chitin in your nails, no. OK, questions? OK. And it, this guy we're not going to worry about. All right, and there's chitin. Blah, blah, you can see the linkages, et cetera. Um, the last thing um, is bacterial cell walls. Bacterial cell walls have some interesting things in them. They have cross-links between polysaccharides 
and peptides. They're called peptidoglycan uh, structures. Peptido, P-E-P-T-I-D-O, G-L-Y-C-A-N, peptidoglycans. Peptide, peptidal referring to the peptide part, glycan referring to the carbohydrate part. Now, these guys give bacteria cell, bacterial cell walls structure and strength. They also give them some resistance to attack. The resistance they give to attack is that these, these guys contain in their peptidal portion a couple of unusual amino acids. All right. they, in fact, they contain two different D amino acids. You may remember we talked about how all the, virtually all the as, amino acids in biology are in the L form. Here's a D uh, glutamic acid and here's a D alanine. Why are they in there? Just a second. They're in there to keep proteases from digesting their cell wall. The proteases can't touch those D amino acids. Okay? Nature is using, has evolved a defense against the bacteria being broken down by, pep, by proteases that would eat their cell walls. Did you have a question? So cross-links between peptides, that is amino acid, amino acid polymers, and carbohydrates. Yes? So the D form is a different form of amino acids. Remember, we have the D and L amino acids. In biology, 99.999% of the amino acids that are produced biologically are made in the L configuration. That's the only form that we see. Here is a very rare case where they're made in the D form. And in the D form, they're not what a protease would act on. A protease just can't touch them. So that's, that's what the significance of those is. It's not in all bacterial cell walls, but it's, 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 con it's not uncommon in bacteria. Yeah. Yes? Can you say the amino acid Yeah, it's D-glutamic acid right there and D-alanine right there. And this is virtually the only place we see them in biology. Virtually the only place we see them in biology. It gives a lot of protection against proteases. If, if the bacteria don't have these, protease breaks those bonds, now all of a sudden the cell wall becomes very very loose, very permeable, and you can kill the cell very easily. Yes, sir? So if there's only a couple of these D amino acids, why couldn't the protein? Well, this is part of a repeating structure. So if you look at this, this is part of a repeating structure. About, what, 40% of the amino acids are in the D form. So they're going to be present elsewhere as well. So it's not like this is only two out of 1,000 or something like that. About 40% of them are going to have that. So there's, they're abundant enough that the protease doesn't have a way to get in and do its thing. OK. That's the last of what I'll say there. OK. So that's what I'll say about carbohydrates. I know there's a lot of nomenclature there. And one of the good things about nomenclature is you can memorize nomenclature pretty, stra pretty straightforwardly. Okay? And I think you should know the nomenclature. Um, I haven't showed you the structure of, of sucrose. Let me give you that structure before I forget. I put it on uh, the lecture, and that's right here. Oh, I'm sorry. I thought that's not what I wanted. Sorry about that. I will post. I I, I have. <laughs> I don't know what I did there. Uh, I have a, a hand-drawn structure that I have that I think is much easier to understand. I'll post that for you. I, I thought it was on here. I didn't realize it wasn't. Okay. So you have something to wait for. Yes, ma'am. Well, when you say convert, I mean, I would ask you either one or the other. So I'm not going to ask you to draw an intermediate or something like that. But I might expect that you would be able to draw a Hayworth of any of those or a Fisher of any of those. Yeah. Give it one or the other. Yeah. OK. okay. Well, not, no, no, give them one or the other. No, I might say, draw me, this, draw me a Hayworth projection for glucose, for alpha glucose. Yeah, or something like that. So yeah, I mean, I would expect that, that those are structures that you